Well, hello and welcome to the December 18, 2022 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. And our contact information is at the end of this video. Please use it, especially during this Christmas season to come and visit us on a Sunday morning on December 18th. It'll be the morning of our children's program. I don't know when this video will officially get uploaded, but if you still have time, come on December 18th to see our children's program. And then we are having service on Christmas, December 25th. So what a great time for you to come and be a part of our fellowship. If you have any questions about the ministry, the email is also part of that contact information that's through the World Wide Web. Would love to hear from you. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews. Stay with us as we transition in and out of our music ministry right now. And then open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1 for our study.
Please open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 4 to 14 as we come back to a text of scripture that we started studying in last week's video, a text of scripture that deals with the superiority of Jesus over angels. And we're not in the book of Revelation because during the Christmas season I thought how appropriate would it be for us to take a few lessons to focus <coughs> on the person of Jesus Christ. In light of the Christmas season, I realize it's very important for us to understand who Jesus is. Now, being Hammond's Bible Church, as we often say, we want to do everything with the Bible. And we recognize at Christian Fellowship Church, as I noted last week, that we don't know when Jesus was born. Uh, the culture recognizes December 25th. Most likely he could have been born in the spring, but we don't know. But the reality of it is, is he had to be born one out of the 365 days. And so... We go with the culture and the celebration, but we don't want to go with the celebration and the focus on the Santa and the presents and the reindeer and all the, the stuff that's attached to it. And it's hard because it is so much a part of our culture. And with our culture being so gone and not wanting anything to do with the true Bible, the true God, it's hard to get the true message out because our culture really doesn't want to focus on who Jesus is. They want to focus on the presence. They want to make sure there are two trucks in the parking lot or the driveway when they wake up on a Christmas morning. And they want to make sure they get the diamonds and the jewelry and all the other stuff. All the trappings that come with a very materialistic holiday. They want to have all of the family celebrations that make it a special Hallmark movie kind of Christmas. When in actuality, the focus should be on who Jesus is and why he came. <coughs> and last week we talked about how the book of Hebrews is a perfect book to allow us to do just that. It's a book that focuses on the superior of Jesus throughout many different types of comparisons. Prophets, angels, Moses, covenants. You go through the entire book, and I hope it will be something that you will do if you haven't done it already. And last week, as we talked about Hebrews as a book that focuses on the excellence of Jesus and the superiority of Jesus, I said there's a great verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that talks about running the race of endurance and fixing our eyes on Jesus. And I used the illustration of how we could be in a snow-covered field and look at a mile down the road and if we would focus on a point it would be very similar to how we in our hearts are to focus on Jesus because it will keep us on the straight and narrow. I love that passage because it talks about our lives being like an endurance race. Our lives are not a sprint. If we live 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years as a Christian there's going to be a lot of hardships and a lot of difficulties like in a marathon race that are going to cause you to want to give up, to be distracted, to go off focus, and yet we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So that illustration was, you focus on him, you'll keep a straight and narrow path. But adding to that illustration this week, I add that if you're focusing on Jesus and all of a sudden you see something glittery, something shiny that diverts your attention, and now you're looking in a different direction, and now you're going in that different direction, the reality of it is that whatever catches your eye and takes your focus away in the end is going to be found to be empty. And using a metaphor from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he found everything that he was pursuing in life was dumb, poop. It, and so well, let's just, you know, not belaboring that too much. It's just the idea of that it's not anything of value. And you know, you look at where people are putting their time, their talents, and their treasures in life, and they are pursuing the wrong thing, the people of the world. The church makes, needs to make sure we're keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. Because as we get to the end of our life, we want to make sure that we have faithfully pursued the right thing. And I think, I think a parallel passage to the Hebrews 12 passage would be 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 verses 15 to 17 that says this do not love the world nor the things of the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him so 
all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boast of pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So you're going after the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boast of pride of life. That's what you're focusing on. It's not from God. It's from the world, and you're going down the wrong path. So the world is passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever, lives forever, however your version says. So listen, this is just another way of saying keep your focus on Jesus. Now again, it's so important for this time of year because it's so easy to become blasé about the true meaning of Christmas because of the overshadowing aspect of what our culture throws at us. And the world has made it more about material things, when in actuality we need to stand in awe of who Jesus is. That's why this holiday season, I do like to take these passages. I do like to go over how great Jesus is. And so we started last week talking about the very fact that in verse 4, the author of Hebrews is speaking about how Jesus is better than angels, superior, more excellent than angels. And this is the second comparison. He's already talked about being better than the prophets. Now he's going to focus on angels, and he's going to do it from verse 4 to verse 14. And the reason this is so important for the author of Hebrews is he's writing to a Jewish audience is because as we did the cultural background last week, the idea of how highly regarded angels became in the Jewish culture. And just for time's sake, in this video, I would tell you, go back to last week's video and I read more detail for how the Jews really honored angels. They, they, they basically put them all, almost on par with God himself. And so it very much is important that Jesus is shown to be greater than the angels. And so we see in verse 4, he says, Having become as much better than the angels, he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And the very first of five topics or traits <coughs> about Jesus is that we saw that he has been given a superior name. And that name was the Son of God. And what the author of Hebrews begins to do is show the Jewish audience, the original recipients of this letter, passages from the New Testament. He just starts, excuse me, passages from the Old Testament, where he's just piling on passage after passage. And a name represents all that you are. And the name there was Son of God. And just as a point of review, the idea is it wasn't talking about the name Jesus but a title that was sort of a messianic title. A messianic title where we recognized that it conveyed an equality with God. And we did a theological survey of how, throughout the Bible, the idea of one being <coughs> called the Son of God put Jesus on par with God the Father. And so we went through like a passage like in John 17 where Jesus gave the high priestly prayer and basically spoke about his pre-existence and his relationship with God the Father. It's very clear, you can't come away from there without understanding that Jesus as the Son, as he stops with the Father, is God himself. But now as we talk about Son of God and being the title of one who has come to earth as a man, it's a title for the Messiah, but understanding that he is the God-man. And so that Son of God conveyed his deity. And we went through the aspects of his eternal eternality, his omniscience, and being omnipresent, his being omnipotent. And so as we work through that idea of how he is recognized as the Son of God throughout different aspects of his life, it wasn't that he became like the Son in that sense of becoming the second person of the Trinity who's called the Son but more of the aspect of the Messianic title, Son of God, like when at his incarnation in Luke 1, um, that through the birth process, there's this declaration of him being called Son of God, Luke 1, 32 and 35. And then he was recognized this at his baptism in Luke 3, 22, and then declared Son of God at his resurrection, as Romans 1, 4 said. Well, Jesus was the Son of God prior to that, but there's the sense of the fulfillment of him being the Messiah and, and walking fully down that road of being one who is doing what the Messiah needs to do. So, hey, he's the one who is now declared Son of God through his resurrection. So the idea is angels never had this name. Angels collectively would be called sons of God, but they've never been called Son of God in a unique individual way recognizing it's also the messianic title 
and no angel has ever been called the Messiah. So we recognize that. Now we come to the second attribute that we kind of elaborated and elaborated on in last week's video, but I want to go a little bit deeper in it because I didn't get to this on Sunday morning in service. So I thought I'd go deeper in this video for you. And that is when we come to verse 6, and it says, And when he again brings the firstborn in the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And he quotes Psalm 97, 7, and also a tie-in to Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. And it's interesting, the passage <coughs> from Deuteronomy is considered, where he, it's pulled from, is a Greek version of, of the Old Testament. Um, so the idea is that this is being quoted about how the angels are being called to worship him. Now, this is important that we understand that we are talking about Son of God, who is the Messiah, with this aspect of worship. All right, And the idea of worship is when you give someone their worth, their value. And so verse 6 says, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, and the idea of firstborn is a expression that regards begotten in the sense of uh, a, one, who is a, one who is born who has a special recognition, a special nature. And let me see where I got my notes in this. Um, yeah, it's the idea of firstborn has nothing to do with time as if like in sequence but it refers to position. It's not a description, but a title, meaning the chief one. The concept was associated with firstborn because the oldest son usually was heir to the father's entire state. But the first son to be born was not always the firstborn. Esau, for instance, was older than Jacob, but Jacob was the firstborn. The prototokos, where as Genesis 49, verse 3 says, gives a good description of firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in and power. Might, strength, dignity, and power, these describe the meaning of firstborn. It's not a time word. It's a right to rule word, an authority word. And Jesus Christ is the supreme firstborn, the supreme protocos, the supreme right to rule son. These passages, therefore, do not refer to Christ's birth as such, but to his sovereignty. And that is a quote from John MacArthur's commentary on Hebrews. And so we, we get the idea here that, you know, when you look at Jesus, the Son, he is the one the angels are being called to worship. And if these angels are great, superior beings, you would think that you should worship them. And it's ironic in the scriptures, sometimes people see angels, like in Daniel, and they want to worship them. But the angels say, don't, you don't worship me, you know, because I'm not the one that's supposed to get the worth, the value. And, and so what we have here is that by bringing in these passages, speaking of angels worshiping, angels worshiping the Son of God, there's the sense where one who's going to come to earth is going to have to be God come in the flesh for the angels to worship them, worship him. Okay, and so, uh, you know, we, we look at this idea when Jesus was born in Luke chapter 2, verse um, 13 and 14. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels saying, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. What were they doing? They were, they were worshiping. And, you know, the culmination of the New Testament is when you come to Revelation chapter 5, when you see Jesus in the throne room. We see God the Father in chapter 4 in the book of Revelation, but then in chapter 5, you get this line, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then, you know, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, um, praise, honor, glory, and power be it forever and ever and ever. Amen. This is the idea of giving worth to Jesus. And, and so when you look at worship, it's that aspect of giving one recognition, giving worth. So what, what does it mean? And I came across um, this quote that Warren Wiersbe had, and it talks about <clears throat> giving worth it, it t is tied to our submission of our nature to God. And he says, true biblical worship so satisfies our total personality that we don't have to shop around for man-made substitutes. William Temple made this clear in his masterful definition of worship. 
He writes, for worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose, and all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable, and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin, and the source of all actual sin. And so, think about this. Submitting your entire nature to God. It is a consciousness that thinks constantly of His holiness. It's the nourishment of your mind on His truth. It's the purifying imagination of just beauty when you look at and understand who He is as God. The opening of our heart to His love, the surrender of our our will to whatever he wants all gathered up with adoration uh, a selfless emotion and, and you know this isn't just a an academic exercise it is something that takes over your emotions and I wanted to start mentally as you understand and grasp who Jesus is as you understand who God is but then it just flow into loving praise and singing and I've been reading through several Psalms this week and how so many of them talk about singing praise to God. And that is something I want to do in my own private worship, and I do. And I want to do it in public worship, and I do. You want to sing to God, and I know many of you do as well, because it is, it's an emotional outburst of praise. And the idea of worship has been what God wants mankind to do. Now, you don't see passage after passage of worship in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, I think the first time worship appears is when Abraham was uh, going to, ironically, sacrifice Isaac. He talked about going up on the mountain to worship. But you really get into the concept of what God is expecting mankind when you come to the book of Exodus as God gives the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus chapter 20, you can just jot this down, the second commandment is that we're not to worship idols. And, you know, we're not under the Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments in the New Testament, but then you have a passage in 1 John that ends the very book of 1 John that talks about stay away from idols. And anything that you're putting your time, your talent, your treasure in above God, it's not that we don't live in this world, we don't use time, talent, treasures for other you know, aspects of living in this world, but honestly ask yourself, what are the things that you put your time, talent, and treasure to? Because to me, that's what you're worshiping. And Exodus chapter 34, as you know, the Jews are getting more instruction, so you come to Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. So Exodus 34, verse 14, you get this exhortation, you shall not worship any other God. And that becomes the ongoing challenge for the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament, where they're constantly being looking for what glitters, what, is, what they think is going to supply their needs, and do it on their own timetable. When in actuality, God's got a different timetable, and God's a good God. But, you know, the glitter of things will take your attention away, divert your attention away. And so, you know, even in the New Testament, our worship is to be diverted, devoted to God. When we come to um, the book of Philippians, chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about how true believers worship in spirit. And the idea, I love the idea of spirit because it's not just um, exterior what we do. Spirit gets to the heart of who we are, where our passions are. And, and so when we look at who Jesus is, we are to give him his worship. <clears throat> and like pulling this all into the Christmas story, I find it interesting in Matthew chapter 2, I think about three times where the Magi have come to do what? Worship Jesus. And you can turn there, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, um, where the, 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 these Magi, these wise men from the east have come and when they come to worship Jesus, it's maybe a year after he's born, not on Christmas Eve, it was like so many Christmas cards portray, but it could be a year to two years afterwards, we see in Matthew chapter 2 that it says after Jesus was born, the Magi came, verse 1 says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. And the dialogue goes, Herod said, um, when, having heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. 
and gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, <coughs> for this has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, by no means least the one leaders of Judah, and out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to him to report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. And I point this out that okay, you know the Christmas cards all point these magi's bowing down to the baby, and and what I find so interesting in this dialogue, and often when you, know, you study it, is that when the the magi say to Herod, "We've come to worship," you see that in verse two. Why doesn't Herod say? Time out. Uh, we're only supposed to worship God. Why are you worshiping this baby? Well, I think the Magi understood it was God come in the flesh. I think they had the right understanding of who the Messiah had to be. I don't know how much they had insight from the Old Testament, but you only worship God, people. And somewhere the light bulb should have gone on, and Herod should have said, well, you know, if, if this guy's just a human being, why in the world are you worshiping him? But when you understand that he is God come in the flesh, that's why he grant, he's to be given this worship. That's why it, it's mind-boggling for us when we really look at what Christmas is supposed to be, the celebration of his birth, that we get it all entangled with the Santa Claus stuff. Again, I don't want to bemoan the culture, but the reality of it is, is the culture is taking our attention off of Christ, and I need to keep it focused. We need to understand what the Magi understood is that he needs to be worshipped. And so, as when he actually is born, like I quoted earlier in Luke 2, he is. He is worshipped by those angels. And I think it's, you know, as Jesus himself will talk about in his temptation, that we're to worship the Lord and serve him only. Well, you know, worship the Lord your God. And obviously, the idea of, of Jesus understanding how, as a human, he had a responsibility of worshipping God the Father, um, the idea of the fact that uh, ultimately, as we come to understand, declared Son of God, declared the Messiah, that as Jesus passed all the tests, he is the one that we worship as, as the Messiah now. We understand that the, the picture is complete. Now, again, one more time, he was always the Son of God. He comes to earth and is, lives as the Messiah. And there was aspects and stages from the baptism, uh, from the birth to the baptism to the death and resurrection, declared Son of God. So my point, though, is, is that when we look at this and we understand who Jesus is, let's really go into the Christmas season and give him his worth and keep that focus. But do it not just one day out of the year, but 365 days out of the year. Because truly, where you put your focus, where you put your time, talent, and treasures, where your heart is. And I had this illustration I was talking to, ironically, a counselor this week. And I'm going to change the story up. But the, he was basically telling me about an individual that he knew that was involved in the church. And basically, for um, 10 years, he had seen something in this individual that... that wasn't just right. And I, I'll use this illustration where that uh, basically the individual uh, doesn't get treated right. So it'd be similar to maybe like an individual working for a company and not getting a bonus. All the other employees get bonuses and now this individual came and realized, wow, I'm not getting a bonus and now felt justified to steal from the employer and basically just does that. And when they get you know, caught, they, they, they justify it. Well, I wasn't treated right. I, I have every reason to act like this. And you know, then they end up leaving the church and they end up doing other bad things all because now they feel like they have an out. They have a justification for why they do that. And the, the counselor was interesting. Um, he told me as talking to this individual that over his interactions and counselings with this person that it became very evident that what happened at the time of this theft 
wasn't just a once in a moment lifetime experience. It, it had been in that individual life for 20, 25 years, they just faked their Christianity. They faked it, and they were looking for an excuse, an opportunity to finally justify their evil actions. And I tell you this, as the Bible warns us over and over and over, guard your heart, watch over your heart, because when you're, you have a heart that's worshiping the wrong thing, it, you're able to suppress it and control it for a while, but eventually what you love is going to come out. And what comes out will cause great destruction. As someone said to me this week, why do I have to follow God? I, well, the reality of it is, you, you don't follow God, but it, the, the person that doesn't follow God is going to find a world that is going to not be very kind to them. Um, the idea that I shared a couple weeks ago of how Satan eats his own, right? As we talked about the Babylonian harlot when Satan was all done with her. He just <laughs> disposed of her. And, and the reality of it is, <clears throat> you go down the path of chasing the shiny thing, you're going to suffer for it. And you become what you worship. Um, I came across this article. It says, James Michener, writing in his book, The Source, tells um, the story of a man who was a farmer living around 2200 B.C. And he worshipped two gods, one a god of death, the other a god of fertility, and he ends up sacrificing his son. And his wife watches this, and, and there's no problem there until the head of the temple basically goes and says, um, you know, who wants to spend a week with the temple prostitute? And her husband jumps forward, and then she realizes, oh, my goodness, what kind of husband do I have? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, that's what it took for you to wake up. But, you know, you, you be... You, you go down a path of worshiping the wrong thing, and it's going to eat you up. It's going to destroy you. And uh, another illustration um, by a man named Harold Shaw, Harold Shaw uh, by um, James Packer and Harold Shaw Publishers says, what other gods? And it says, what other gods could we have beside the Lord? And the answer is plenty. He says, for Israel, there were Canaanite, Baals, those jolly nature gods whose worship was a rampage of gluttony, drunkenness, and ritual prostitution. For us, there are still the great gods, sex, shackles, and stomach, an unholy trinity constituting one god self, and the other enslaving treasure, trio, pleasure, possessions, and position, who, whose worship is described as the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, as I quoted in 1 John 2.16. And he goes, you can take football, the firm, and family are also gods for some. Indeed, the list of other gods is endless. For anything that anyone allows to run his life becomes his god, and the claimants for his prerogative are legion. And the matter of life's basic loyalty, temptation is a many-headed monster. And, I, and, and, and the reality of it is, is there's many things that glitter. But here I'm trying to tell you that what you see pulling you away is not truly God. And in the end, you're going to find it done. So you look at verse 5, and I, excuse me, verse 6, and it says, And when he again brings the firstborn in the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. Jesus deserves worship. The one that's born in the manger deserves our worship. And today I remind you to keep your focus on Jesus. And, and last week I closed the um, Sunday morning service telling the illustration of how Jesus takes the punishment of a murderer in our place. And you... If you didn't see, if you didn't hear that, you could maybe listen to our podcast. But just the shortening idea is the reason we are just so in awe of this one who was born in the manger is he's born to die. And he takes the penalty that we deserve. And when we recognize that he is the Son of God better than angels, then we should stand more in awe because he is the greatest gift ever. And that's my hope and my desire that you all recognize that. That... Jesus is one that deserves our worship. He gets worshipped by the angels. And if he's worshipped by the angels, who are these great creatures, what more should we do? Let's focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And as I've been saying over and over and over, you need to believe and follow the rudimentary, basic, simple ABCs of salvation. Admit your sinner, Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon his name. A, admit your sinner. B, believe. C, call upon his name. And 
you will be saved. God bless.